Hello and welcome to episode 79 of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. My name's Rob Woods and this is the show for anyone who works in fundraising, who wants ideas and maybe a little dose of inspiration to help you enjoy your job and raise more money, especially during the pandemic. And today, if you're the leader of a fundraising team, or you have any leadership role in your personal life, or you're just curious about what makes a difference in successful leadership, then I hope you're going to find this episode helpful. Because today I'm sharing another section from a keynote speech I originally did at my Breakfast Club for Fundraising Leaders, and which is now available as one of many learning bundles we provide for fundraisers through our Bright Spot Members Club. The talk was inspired by a fascinating book called The Captain Class by Sam Walker. If you want more of the story, go to episode 78 of this podcast, where I explain it in a bit more detail. But for now, the gist is that he looked at all the data he could find showing the success of professional sports teams going back since records began. And he found the 16 most successful teams, including, for instance, an All Blacks rugby team in the 1980s that didn't lose for three and a half years. In this top 16, he found teams from a broad range of sports, including a stunningly successful Brazilian women's volleyball team and one extraordinary Russian men's ice hockey team, as well as a couple of teams you're more likely to have heard of, like the Barcelona men's football team that won four domestic titles and two Champions League titles across a six-year period in the late noughties. Then Walker searched to see if there was one factor that all of these successful teams had in common. What he discovered was that there was only one, and it was that their extraordinary success began around the time that one individual was made captain. He argues that it is possible for an individual leader to have an extraordinary influence on the performance of those around them. And he was curious as to what those 16 captains did in particular that had this powerful effect on success. In the book, he explores seven traits, many of which are not what students of sport and leadership would necessarily predict. In episode 78 of this podcast, I shared two traits in particular and drew parallels to what I've studied about outstanding leadership in fundraising. Firstly, none of these 16 ultra-successful captains gave inspiring Churchillian speeches, but instead they engaged in consistent, often very low-key, practical communication with their teams. And secondly, they were relentless to an extreme degree. They displayed a dogged determination as well as a willingness to do the unglamorous tasks, whatever necessary, to achieve the goal. Crucially, these behaviours had a powerful effect on the commitment and effort levels of those around them. In today's episode, I'm pleased to share another excerpt from my original talk, in which I look at the unhelpful myth of the heroic leader, which we've been given from Hollywood movies and lots of other popular culture. And I share what Sam Walker found in his research into the traits of very successful leaders that confounds this enticing myth. And I go on to share some things that I've noticed very successful charity leaders do that's consistent with Walker's findings. We pick up my talk as I start to explore the third idea I got from Sam's book, The Captain Class. I I definitely think there is a sort of a misunderstanding. It's definitely a sport. And also I think in some other kinds of leadership um, that, to be a great fundraising leader, you've got to be a, an amazing fundraiser. It's part of what part of part of the mix, you know. And certainly in sport, if you look at you know comics like Roy of the Rovers, Roy, the captain, is the one who scores all the goals. Or you know, cult figures um, like Michael Jordan, you know, stars like Zinedine Zidane must have been the captain, mustn't they? And the one of the really emphatic things that I took from the book is in sport these top 16 very successful leaders were never the team's number one charismatic star who scored the goals and so on. They just weren't. There, was, there were always other players who were more skillful and got more glory and did more scoring. And my view is the same is true in fundraising, that you don't need to have amazing attention to detail and skill in the various bits of fundraising to help your team succeed phenomenally. The most telling bit, probably I've done now 65 podcast interviews in the last um, year and a half. One of the most telling moments in the whole series is in episode 53, when I was talking to Paula Radley from Greenpeace UK. And I don't know if you know the story of just some brilliant things Greenpeace UK did 
in the summer of 2020, with all that fear and uh, worry about safety and so on, this is after the first lockdown, the government is encouraging us to go out about our business, albeit in a safe way. And Greenpeace were cautious about whether they could or should get their face-to-face fundraising team out the door, uh, seeing if people who still care about the environment wanted to, to donate and sign up and so on. For, like Hardly any charities I'm aware did do that. You know, Understandably, they were cautious about risk. But intriguingly, Greenpeace UK and Paula, the leader of this team, she managed to get her team out for, I, I think, several months in some of the UK, and they went door to door. And one of the, I mean, there's various interesting, innovative things they did in order to manage that risk, um, for, crucially for the fundraisers themselves, as well as the householders. But one of the, the eye-catching details is to reassure fundraiser and householder, is in, in addition to doing a door drop in advance, so you could signal you didn't want them to ring your doorbell. One of the eye-catching things was they created a two metre long mat with a lovely picture of an orange orangutan in a rainforest with his arms all open. And they unrolled that on the doormat before they rang the doorbell. And they had a metal hook to ring the doorbell so they weren't touching it. They would stand two metres back and went, can you imagine a householder opening their door, seeing a, a polite and respectful two metre back Greenpeace clad person, and they can't help but see an image which brings to life, you know, something to do with their values and the uh, and the environment and what a difference that made. Now, they did a bunch of other things. Uh, the good news story is they raised 20 percent more money through this campaign than in equivalent pre-COVID campaigns the year before. The most telling bit of the interview is near the end, I say, is there anything else you learned or you thought was interesting about why this success managed to happen? And Paula was really clear. She said the most important element in why all of this heroic thing happened was our senior leadership. It trusted us and empowered us to make the decision. They empowered me as the leader of this team to judge the risk appropriately, look after my team and manage the risk for the organization and for householders. It's because I'm so trusted here. Without that, you know, it wouldn't have happened. And to, and to be honest, my view is in lots of lots of organizations, that sounds easy, but in practice, that is actually one of the hardest things in leadership is to create that culture where people are empowered to be at their best, to be in the sporting metaphor, at their best, doing their skill, going and scoring goals. And the leader's job is to empower you and create an environment in which you can go out and do that. Leading from the back, not the front, is a thing that the 16 sports captains did. Um, and another of the seven is actually a willingness to do the thankless jobs in the shadows. Now, lots of you are wholly aware how much you've been doing thankless jobs in the shadows for the last year and a half. And my message is, I get that. And well done. It's the right thing to do. So much of leadership is not about limelight or, uh, you know, or is, is even seen. But the best leaders find a way to do what it, do what's necessary, do what it takes so that, for instance, in this context, the face to face team can go out and succeed. So when I said to, to Liz, um, to go back to the area of their example, um, what do you think that the balance is between time you spend on looking after team and culture and looking after people versus how important is the donor? She said almost all of her energy is spent thinking about team and colleagues rather than donors. Now, again, big caveat, lots of you on this call, you're in an organization where you've got to do lots of fundraising and some leadership. So I get that. I'm not saying you don't have to spend lots of energy on donors and decisions about data and uh, and fundraising as well. So of course you do, because you're doing both jobs. But when you're doing your leadership bit of your role, um, Liz was emphatic that she does she does everything she can to empower the other person to be at their best and do their skill. But her role um, is making that possible. I thought it was really interesting that various people I've interviewed, they said they were good leaders, but their greatest Achilles heel, two or three people said to me is, I should spend more time with my team, I, I, but I end up not spending enough time with my team because, you know, I, I know fundraising in and out and I, I end up get spending time on fundraising, and then some of my relationship time with my direct reports drops. Joe Jenkins, when he was in our Bright Spot Members Club, he, he put it this way, 
Originally, years ago, there was a notion that you have to be all knowing and clever and the expert. And when life's moved slower, that was a bit more possible. Actually, it was never very effective anyway, because you, you need to em- empower people with agency even then. But Joe Jenkins, when he spoke a couple of years ago for my club, he said emphatically now what the most effective leaders tend to do in fundraising is they spend their energy being a gardener of culture and helping people feel confident, proactive and skillful. They spend time as gardeners, not chess masters. And that's part of, again, part of the rationale, in my view, for why the very successful B campaign for Friends of the Earth years ago was so successful. It wasn't one person's clever strategy. It was dozens and dozens and dozens of of strategies and tactics consistent with the whole that people were empowered to creatively implement. On Breakfast Club a couple of months ago, Davinia shared a really similar thing. And if you want to check it out, episode 62 of my podcast, although her charities had stunning results in the last year, hardly any of what Davinia talks about is fundraising technique. Almost all of it is what she's done as a leader and with the team to help them do really well. And again, I appreciate that you guys understand this. Maybe the intention of my presentation is just to reassure you to keep doing what you're doing. If, 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 you know, if, if you care deeply about your team and you sometimes struggle to make time for that, um, my signal is, of course, you've got to get your own fundraising done. But I have observed any time you can create to do this kind of water carrier leadership, unglamorous tasks to help someone else succeed. That's what I've observed in sport and in fundraising. Um, in terms of doing it practically, this is so, you know, I appreciate you might be really struggling and fed up now. Um, and the last thing you need is me telling you to do more of this and less of that. Um, so that's not my intention. But one of the most valuable things I've noticed in the last year and a half, if you possibly can, is literally look after yourself first. So A, mentally, you can't help someone else if you're you're struggling because of the understandable demands and pressures and decision making and lockdown. But also literally, by which I mean, years ago, I often... I wasn't at my best during the day because I hadn't, I'd intended to do a bit of meditating or intended to go for a little walk or intended to read a book to inspire me. And I didn't get around to it because the day came at me. One of the most powerful shifts I made years ago was to read this book called The Miracle Morning. And I mean, it's not a sexy thesis, but it's an effective thesis. He says, do the thing that looks after your own well being first thing in the morning. And for some of you, that's a walk. For Diagonal, uh, now at Sustrans, uh, it's 25 minutes of exercise on her, her static bike. Um, for some of you, it's just pausing to be great. What am I grateful for for five minutes or do some journaling? Whatever the thing is, do it early in the day before the day comes at you. That gives you maximum chance of being able to do this other stuff I've talked about, about being relentless and you know working so hard to look after your team and, and, and so on. Look after yourself first is still among the most valuable habits I could recommend you try again you know you might have a tiny baby who's 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 up at five in the morning anyway so that you know I appreciate not all of these things work for everyone but I I think this is a, a, a crucial thing across the day get it done early and then you you have the resources to do this other really challenging stuff for the rest of the day um give it time uh rich uh, turner was um very successful leader of solar aid years ago and they achieved fabulous growth a small charity um and when i asked him how you know you know as a leader you know what's the single most interesting improvement you've made in your career as a leader he said i listened to a podcast and it sounds so obvious rob but i realized i wasn't doing it the podcast said at a minimum for half an hour each week make sure you have half an hour with each of your direct reports in your team and that sounds so obvious, but uh, he said to me, because I love fundraising and I'm good at fundraising and I often I intend to do that, but it ends up getting nudged away. And sometimes you go two or three weeks without having a, a, that regular catch up with, with your team. And Richard said, once I started doing that and, and locking it in, not bumping it for a donor or fundraising things, apart from in an extreme emergency, he said, 
I was amazed how amazing it was. And his little recipe was to um, do at least 10 minutes of it was just listening to the other person, what they wanted to talk about, rather than Richard control the agenda. Um, be careful what role you play. Um, it's just really tempting every day as a leader, people come to you with problems and often they're problems you know more about because you, you've got fundraising experience to, before you got promoted. Beware how easy it is to just give them the answer. And one, you know, the good news about this tip is you'll have a chance at some point across the next couple of days to practice this because someone will come to you. Oh, what shall I do about that failed sponsorship proposal? In that moment, my advice is pause. Don't jump in with the, the easy answer. Say, well, what do you think? And often they'll say, well, I don't know. But if you just hold your nerve and believe in their ability to say, well, what do you think of some of the issues? In that moment, it'll take a tiny bit longer, but you send a signal to them that you believe they are capable and have some of the answers. That massively pays you back in the medium term because people get become more and more empowered and likely to think for themselves rather than come to you for advice. So what great leaders do, in my view, is they empower everyone else around them to become the best they can be, to become great leaders. And that tactic, though easy to explain, um, is not always easy to do because it's so tempting to just give the answer and save time. Well, I hope you found these ideas were helpful food for thought. If you did, please do remember to subscribe to the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast today so that you can get access to lots more episodes, including, for instance, episode 78, which is on this same subject of outstanding leadership. If you'd like a full transcript and a summary of the episode, as well as a couple of helpful links, go to the podcast section of our website, which is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. And if you're curious to see my full film and our notes about how to do this style of leadership, it's one of many dozens of films in our learning library for fundraisers who are part of the Bright Spot Members Club. If you don't have membership, but you're curious about how the club works, both for individuals and for teams, go to brightspotmembersclub.co.uk forward slash join. Now, I'd like to say a massive thank you to everyone who's been commenting and sharing this podcast on social media or to your colleagues, helping us to get this free content out to as many charities as possible during this difficult year. And if you were able to take a moment to share today's episode, I'd be really grateful. Also, I'd love to hear what you think about this episode. You can find me easily on LinkedIn and on Twitter, I'm at Woods underscore Rob. Thank you so much for listening today. Best of luck as you develop your fundraising and your leadership skills. And I look forward to sharing another Fundraising Bright Spots episode with you very soon. <laughs>